to report. I'm State Representative Keith Gillespie of the 47th District in York County. I'm here at the 96th Pennsylvania Farm Show. This is the premier event for agriculture, which is the Commonwealth's number one industry. The dual mission of the show is to highlight and honor our farmers and food producers while educating the non-farming public about the industry. Joining me now to discuss some current farming issues is the Secretary of the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, George Gregg. Welcome, Secretary Gregg, to Legislative Report. Thank you, Keith. Thanks for letting us come into, really, your, your venue and, uh, and your hall. Welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great to be here. Um, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about your background. I know you're new to the position, as is uh, all the secretaries in Government Corbett's uh, cabinet. And where is home for you, and what is your background? Crawford County is my home. I have a 650-acre farm in Crawford County in partnership with my brother. Uh, we were dairy farmers for 30 years. Uh, now we are crop farmers, but uh, uh, still love to get out there on the farm and work. Don't get much of a chance to do that anymore, but... Uh, yeah, hopefully your, your brother's carrying uh, his end of the yes, log, I guess. Yes, he is. 650 acres is a yep. lot of, uh, of land to take care of, but obviously if, it, if you're doing the crop versus the dairy, it's uh, probably a little bit uh, easier to do. Yes, it is. So. Okay, well, we're sort of cut from the same cloth. I was raised on a farm in southern Lancaster County, uh, not 650 acres, but 111 acres, and uh, we had uh, a little bit of everything, including uh, crops and, uh, and some uh, black Angus beef cattle. So uh, great to have you here, and obviously great to have somebody with, uh, with the, the long background that, that you and your brother bring to uh, the cabinet. Okay. All right, so this is the 96th Pennsylvania Farm Show. Uh, what makes this show unique and still a success after all these years, Secretary? Well, I think because agriculture is constantly changing, the farmers come here to see what's new, the new innovations, and uh, the consumers, as we uh, continue on, we, we get farther and farther from the generations of farmers. Now you've got a back, uh, background in farming, but a lot of people, their, their parents and their grandparents have not had any connection with agriculture. So it's great to have this opportunity to celebrate agriculture for this eight days and have the young people come out and see how their food is produced and, and how their food is grown. So. Right, I understand that the theme this year is uh, farm gate to dinner plate. That's correct. And that is uh, uh, in, in honor of the Pennsylvania Fair Association and the 4-H Association. Both of those organizations are vital to agriculture and the, the continuation of agriculture. And both of those organizations turn 100 years old this year. Wow, that's, uh, that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> and we uh, have... We have uh, a, a butter sculpture, a thousand pounds of butter that commemorates those two organizations. So. Right, I've yet to get over to see uh, this year's sculpture, but I'm sure we'll, we'll be able to, to visualize it yes. here on the clip. Um, but again, I want uh, to, to emphasize the, the farm gate to dinner plate and what you said about uh, um, educating the non-farming public who has the opportunity to come in this week. And it sounds like we're going to have some beautiful weather to allow everybody to come in. They're not going to be fighting uh, snow drifts and, and, and the issues to get here. And it also ties in with buy local food. Because buy fresh, buy local. Buy fresh, buy local. Uh, when we do that, we are putting our dollars back into our local community, which helps our local communities uh, stay alive and it, it, it helps our farmers. Very, very key and important. Um, and just another point I want to make, I mean, let's face it, a lot of people do not realize where their food comes from. They'll go to the local supermarket and for whatever reason they think it's prepared and, and made in the back room because it comes out in this nice cellophane uh, covered package and do not realize a lot of the work that, that, that goes on. And uh, that, That's correct and, and we need to make sure that they look to see where, where, where their food comes from because we can control what's grown in Pennsylvania through inspection. Uh, food safety inspectors, uh, USDA inspectors, FDA inspectors. We have more inspections. We have the safest food supply in the United States uh, as anywhere. And when uh, we bring in food from other, other parts of the world, we don't have that control. We don't have that inspection process in place to protect our people. Good to know that we have that safety net there. Um, I also encourage you to come down to York County sometime, if you will, Secretary. We've uh, been involved in a, an initiative down there called the, uh, the, the Horn Farm for Agricultural Education, and it was a, 
a farm that a, a family donated to the county of York, and we're now in the process of turning that into um, exactly showing how uh, agriculture, the crops are grown, animals are taken care of, uh, emphasizing on the on the uh, the, lo the fresh and local, and encourage you to come down uh, as your schedule would permit, and we'd love to be able to, to show off that entity to you. It, it is within my district in Hellam Township, and uh, I think it's going to going to be right in concert with a lot of the themes that uh, that you're promoting. I, lo I love to come down. Uh, also want to mention that we have an exhibit here at the 96th Pennsylvania Farm Show. It's called Today's Agriculture and they have actually built a, a 40 by 80 barn inside of this building with the cages the exact same uh, size that you'd, you would find in a modern poultry uh, operation and they have the same size Free stalls for dairy cattle and beef cattle stalls, veal calf uh, pens, and uh, uh, swine pens. Wow, that also. sounds like a real uh, must-see kind. Now, what part of the building is that located? It's at? over by the food court. And <laughs> talking about the food court, the food court has every type of food that Pennsylvania has to offer. And what's unique about the Pennsylvania Farm Show is uh, each one of these food booths is run by an agricultural organization. And it is the main fundraiser for uh, that organization for the year. So when you buy your food here, you're also helping to provide money for scholarship programs that each ag, ag organization uh, come, supports. We're just about out of time here for our interview this morning. I thank you for uh, spending uh, a little bit of time with the citizens of the 47th District. Um, thanks a lot for being part of it. Thank you for helping to tell the story of agriculture. Yeah, my honor to do so. 2011 was an extreme weather year that included the destructive floods from Hurricane Lee. Here's the story of how Pennsylvania's farming community coped with the storm and its aftermath. In my area, I suffered a flood in April and another one in September. Uh, the April flood delayed our planting uh, the September flood destroyed about 200 acres of our crops. Uh, we had as much as 22 feet of water on some of our land. My dad started farming in 1949. This is the most challenging year we have ever farmed through. I've had a couple years where we lost more money, but I've never had a more challenging year. Uh, in our area, we were over 30 inches of rainfall above normal. Part of the problem was even the quality of the crop because in many cases, rain does a great deal of damage. Um, we grow tomatoes, for instance. Uh, tomatoes do very well in dry weather, but in wet weather, you, uh, you have a tough time harvesting a quality tomato. You're wrestling with rain check. You're also wrestling with many diseases that uh, find wet and damp conditions very conducive to them. An extremely challenging year for, for all growers, but you know, like all growers, it's now 2012, and we're looking optimistically to the future. From the 1st of September till we were done the end of October, it was rain, rain, and more rain, and the apples on the trees literally split and started to rot, and it made them uh, not very good to store because they had all this moisture in and their their break they broke down much earlier than they normally would usually i have apples at my market till the middle latter part of february and we closed up uh, the first of the year because the fruit was just poor quality so the only good thing about 2011 is it's over well the rains early uh, delayed planting and uh then we had uh, more rain and uh, floods uh, that left a lot of fields underwater. Growers uh, throughout Pennsylvania lost anywhere from a third to half the crop. Uh, you're talking millions and millions of dollars of lost revenue and uh, growers, uh, the, the rest of the crop due to the rain was smaller than normal for those that didn't get completely flooded out. We're hoping that uh, we have a better season next year, but uh, this, this year is pretty much done. 
from the flooding, it made it very difficult to harvest the grapes. Um, most of our grapes had to hang for a little bit longer than we expected, which made it a longer se season than he anticipated because we were hoping that the grapes would dry out. Uh, we specifically lost about three acres of our Riesling um, grapes and um, what we did harvest will require additional work by the winemaker to make it a product that we can sell. This happens in agriculture. We're lucky that we had 2010 and 2009 were pretty good years. So we still have those vintages that we're working on and can sell. It's gonna, it would take about 18 months for 2011s to be put on the shelf. So we're hoping for a good 2012 and there we'll have that for a backup. Farmers are very independent people and uh, they're, they're the first ones to help last ones to ask for help and uh, they uh, they they're very resilient people and, and uh, I think that most of them have received the help that uh, they needed and uh, are well on their way to recovery. A lot of farmers told us this year that this is the most challenging year they've ever had with the weather over decades. I mean, we've had people 70, 80 years old who've been in farming literally all of their lives say this past year has been the most challenging year. You get into the hurricane that we had come through, and although we had a lot of rain with that, we also had issue with the wind. The wind negatively impacted a lot of our orchards, where a lot of uh, things such as apples and peaches just fell off the, off the trees. Once they hit the ground, you can't sell them. They're no good. So there were major losses there. And then the second storm, the remnants of uh, Tropical Storm Lee, you had the massive flooding with all the weather conditions, and that caused problems for everyone. A lot of farmers, especially in northeast and south central area of the state, were flooded. So a lot of their grounds, whether it was from pumpkins to corn to soybeans to green beans, there were major losses there with the flooding. But then you also had uh, other issues because of all that rain. Once again, crops, there was rotting crops in the field. So you could have uh, problems with uh, vegetables as well with that, rotting in the field, corn that you just couldn't use anymore. And if there weren't losses due to the flooding, what you had is a reduction in yield because you did not have a good growing season. This can also hurt farmers now in 2012. Uh, for instance, dairy farmers who grow a lot of their own feed, meaning corn, soybeans, hay, they put it all together, a couple other things in there to feed their animals. If they have to go out and now buy those products, it cuts right off their bottom line of, of profits as well. So they don't have the yield, they don't have as much, they're gonna have to go outside. This is gonna cost them more money. So it makes it difficult. Not only do you have the problems of 2011, but you're gonna have problems in 2012 as well. Up in the, in the northeast, you had a lot of flooding up there. Another issue was for dairy farmers is you, know, you can't keep milk around. And a lot of roads around some of these farms and rural areas were closed for days. So the milk hauler couldn't get in to get the milk, and the farmers basically had to dump the milk because they, they couldn't keep it any longer. Pennsylvania is making it easier to take advantage of the fresh fruits and vegetables available at your local farm market, especially for low-income consumers or seniors on fixed incomes. During Farm Show Week, Tad Kuntz puts in some volunteer time at the apple stand in the food court, but his full-time job is running a central Pennsylvania farm market that participates in the Farmer's Market Nutrition Program. We, we feel like it, it does a great service for the community because we want those, those people to get fruits and vegetables in their hands so they can eat healthier. And the program combines federal and state funds to give $20 worth of vouchers to eligible seniors to spend on fresh Pennsylvania-grown produce. It provides the same service plus free supplemental foods to families who participate in the Women, Infant and Children programs. The farmers markets are growing very rapidly right now. Almost every city has farmers markets now. And most of the farmers markets, most of the vendors accept the vouchers so they can use them there and get fruits and vegetables in their hands. And the quality is so much better than what they're used to seeing at the grocery store in many cases. Michael Packard, Executive Deputy Secretary of the State Department of Agriculture, says this program really helps those who are stranded, so to speak, in our most urban areas. There's areas of cities which are deficient. Uh, they do not have grocery stores and they don't have 
uh, fruit, fresh fruits and vegetables. So when we're able to support getting a farm market into a center city area and pumping fresh fruits and vegetables and Pennsylvania products into there, it really helps the consumers from a nutritional standpoint in those areas. According to Packart, nearly 2,000 farmers markets and roadside stands currently accept the food vouchers. He believes even more will get on board once the word spreads about another brand new program. We just uh, received a federal grant about a year ago to purchase 138 EBT readers. Those are the electronic benefit readers and these readers are wireless so they enable a farm market that's uh, wherever in Pennsylvania um, to be able to accept uh, SNAP benefits from people coming to the farm market. So that was always a barrier possibly as people, uh, especially those that need or nutritionally at risk, did not feel they could afford the products. But now with these EBT readers that we're providing to farm markets, they will be able to use their SNAP benefits there. Each year, $78 million worth of business is done at more than 7,000 markets, where Pennsylvania consumers can get fresh fruit and vegetables straight from the farm. The Farmers Market Nutrition Program creates more customers for these markets while helping more people improve the nutritional value of their diets. Truly a win-win situation. It is a guaranteed income from us because it's a check that, that can't bounce. Uh, we turn it into the, to, to our bank and, and we get the money in return. Um, and in, in return, it's great for the people. And, and farmers always want to, we, we want to help the people. For more information on the Farmers Market Nutrition Program or the EBT machine grants, see the Department of Agriculture website at agriculture.state.pa.us. When you drive down a rural road past a barn, are you able to imagine what goes on inside? A massive display at this year's show opens the barn door and gives folks a peek at how the animals inside are cared for. From farm gate to dinner plate was the theme of this year's show. One of the best demonstrations of this theme was the Today's Agriculture display, a giant barn filled with animals. The goal was to show the care of animals in modern farming. A lot of consumers really have a misconception about how animals are raised. So we kind of wanted to open the doors to each segment. So each thing here is a snapshot of what you'd see if you went into a broiler house, a duck house, a layer house, to kind of give consumers an idea and say, hey, we're opening the doors. We want you to actually get rid of those misconceptions and to trust us. Because there's a lot of distrust there where people think, you know, they think farms are corporately owned when the fact is most farms are actually family farms. What I think it's going to allow them to see is, is that they put the misnomer aside that when the animals are in these facilities that they drive by every day that they're not you know packed in like sardines so to speak, uh, that they're not being mistreated, that they don't have light, they don't have water and a lot of these things that you hear out there about the mistreatments of animals and stuff and when you look at some of the exhibits uh, the poultry here is a good example of it of, of the automatic feeders and the water and the heat lamps and those are things that you would find in these modern facilities today so that we can keep the animals healthy, growing well, growing fast so that they can put a product on, on the consumer's table. Volunteers from each industry fielded questions about what the animals eat, their life cycle and the design of their pens. The crowd has been unbelievable. It's been pretty much jam-packed for the last four days. Um, people are asking a lot of good questions and they're really getting into it. I think people like seeing how animals are raised. They're making the connection that my eggs are coming from this type of system and that's exciting for me to see. Well that's why we kept her home from school today to bring her down to see how things actually go from the farm to your house. I think they take care of the animals. They feed them, they take care of them and I think they're real cute. Visitors were struck by the new techniques being used by farmers today. It's really neat seeing the, the way the new stuff is, you know, how it evolved to come around. Yeah, it's pretty cool. This is pretty modern. How they're feeding the, their animals nowadays with the, the pipes and how they're getting the water to the animals, it's, yeah. it's really nice. It's a lot cleaner. Too. It's a lot cleaner. Many people are also learning that there's more to farming than meets the eye. People are amazed of the science behind agriculture and when I tell them I go to school for it they're kind of blown away because they don't think that you know people go to school you know they're really amazed that we put so much science behind agriculture and there's a reason to what we do I mean we don't just do things I mean everything has a reason a select reason and it's always for the animals benefit feed crops like soybeans and corn were displayed outside of the barn to demonstrate the ways of increasing yields for a society that continues to demand more food
McDonald's keeps adding restaurants, you know, and Sheets gas stations. They keep adding, you know, gas stations that serve food. And these places are going to demand more food, and we had to find better ways to get it and stuff, too. So through modern technologies, we found what are the best ways we can keep the animals healthier, which ways we can make the corn grow faster and more efficiently so when it's harvested, we get the most from the production. The grain, the soybean meal, the corn all takes water, you know, and, and so we've got to be efficient converters of feed into food. Mm -hmm. Sponsors of the exhibit hope that the hundreds of visitors were educated and will now think twice about the food on their plate and the local farmer who supplied it. Everyone knows a big part of the farm show experience is competition, some which results in a lucrative payoff at the livestock auction. But not everyone is aware the auctioneers themselves have a spirited competition to see who's best. When the grand champion steer, hog, and lamb are auctioned off at the Pennsylvania Farm Show, Harry Bachman is usually the man behind the microphone. It's something he was born to do. I watch those auctioneers and I say, someday I'm going to do that. And then at home with my brothers, we'd be playing auction all the time in the playroom. I'd be selling the trucks, the cows, the tractors, and whatever. Bachman's stage is in the livestock sales arena for 30 or so other licensed auctioneers battling it out to be king or queen of the callers. Their stage is 100 yards away in the banquet hall. This is a very serious deal. I'm back home, uh, and you can tell everybody that you won the Pennsylvania Auctioneers contest. When you get the cameras and the lights and everything, it's a, and in front of, like I said, the past bid calling champions, it's a, it's a big deal. The ground rules are simple. Contestants take turns auctioning off donated items to a crowd of bargain hunters and fellow bid callers. Two preliminary rounds narrow the field to 10 finalists, and then a final showdown decides the champion. I'm contestant number 26. No names, just numbers. But that's not what gives an auctioneer his or her identity anyway. It's that voice. Some are melodious. Some are intense. Most are machine gun rounds. It's called the chant, and it's very much an individual thing. But why are all those syllables necessary anyway? The filler is what makes your chant rhythmic and gives it some flexibility. What I was taught was, umbid would you give? So somebody will say, umbid one, would you give two? And then after a while, it just sounds like, umbid one, would have been two, umbid one, would have been two, would have been two. Whatever the style, the auctioneer's objectives are to be heard and understood, even when the bidding gets frenzied. I can work one, and two, sometimes three bidders, but usually you work your first two bidders, Whenever one of them drops out, then you'll go to another bidder. Of course, a good bid caller is expected to be knowledgeable about what he's selling and to drive the price of it as high as it'll go. We're always, we're not concerned about where we start, it's where we finish. Um, you know, the bid is, the, the high bid is established by the buyer, not the, the auctioneer or the seller. It's the want and desires of the audience. Among the past champions in tonight's crowd is 2003 winner Brent Souter, who briefly took the stage for an exhibition performance. Well, I started actually when I was 13 helping an auctioneer set up auctions and uh, through high school I aspired to do that and coming out of high school I uh, was contacted by the Alderfer Auction Company and uh, they hired me, sent me to school, I apprenticed through them and um, the rest is history. Souter's calling to call began in childhood. For many others, it came from family tradition. So My father started the auction business after he retired from the service. And he started his own auction barn, and then he pulled me in, and I was apprenticed with him for two years, and then we did uh, auctioneering as a father-daughter team. Even though only one will be judged best, all the contestants at this year's competition will use this experience to improve their skills and, in turn, their livelihood. And they are all quick to point out that showtime, as they call it, is just one part of being an auctioneer. You gotta get the contracts on, you gotta get your advertising in place, and then you gotta come back, get pictures, get the content list, uh, put that all into to spreadsheets, get it sent out to newspapers, get it put on websites. You have to not mind crawling in dirty, dusty attics. You have to enjoy what you're doing because there's a lot of hard work involved. I just love everything about the business. I love the history behind it, I love the people behind it. There's, there's a different story for everything that you sell. It's an honor to be here today to show one of the Rudder's cows. This is Riley, and here with our coach Kelly Joe Johnson with the uh, with the Rudder Farms. Um, hopefully, you're going to improve on last year. We uh, we didn't finish in the uh, in the top placing, but uh, 
I think it was more the animal's fault than mine. So we're going to hopefully make Riley look good this year and uh, maybe uh, improve on what we did last year. So it's great to be here. and We have a, a wonderful turnout with, uh, with, with folks that are going to watch the event. And again, it's just another venue to uh, illustrate agriculture in this great commonwealth. Uh, he's a very good student. He remembered everything from last year. And the main thing when showing a dairy cattle is they have to remember to walk slow, look at the judge, and how to switch the cow's feet. Uh, my secret is just to stay relaxed and calm on the halter and less is more. You don't want to be playing with the cow too much. You just want to switch your feet and make her look good all the time. Very good. Representative Gillespie, if uh, the animals, as they say, can sense fear, are they sensing anything in you right now? Um, boy, I think Riley, Riley keeps her cards pretty close to her chest. But uh, as Kelly said, uh, she's, you know, we're going to be watching the judge and hopefully we're going to be able to, to give Riley a good show here. That's all the time we have for today's program. I'm State Representative Keith Gillespie. As you've watched this profile of the 96th Pennsylvania Farm Show, I hope you've gained a greater appreciation for agriculture and its importance to our Commonwealth. If you have any questions about today's program or any state government matter, please contact me at my local office. The address and number will be shown in a moment. Thanks for watching, and please join me next time for another edition of Legislative Report. Thank you.